Welcome to part 4 of the Kenwood KR6170 series. In the first episode, I unboxed this new old stock receiver and introduced you to all its crazy gadgets. Kenwood called it the Jumbo because it's huge in size and on features. A drum machine, spring reverb, mic inputs, guitar inputs, and timer, just to name a few. In part two, I gave you a tour of the inside of the KR6170, tested some transistors and capacitors, temporarily fixed the DC on the speaker outputs, and demonstrated the drum machine and microphone. In part three, I fixed the dead FM, demonstrated the Magnum Sleuth tunable FM antenna amp, permanently replaced the filter and audio output caps, and discovered that the guitar input is extremely noisy. If you missed those episodes, I'll leave links in the description. I mentioned in the last episode that I'd like to have some musician friends demonstrate the KR6170 just as they show in the manual. But to do that, I really should fix that noisy guitar input. My guess is that these two 2SC458 transistors are the culprits. Do a search and you'll find they're notoriously noisy. There are at least 12 of these NPN transistors in the receiver used in the guitar preamp, mic preamp, rhythm preamp, main amp, and reverb mixing boards. I'm only noticing a problem on the guitar preamp, so I'll just replace the 2SC458 transistors there, and I'll use two of these highly fashionable KSC 1845s as replacements. On the bottom of the chassis, we can see the 320 dB amp boards Ken would use for the rhythm section, mic inputs, and guitar inputs. They're pretty tiny, and each is exactly the same. Let's replace the transistors in the guitar board now. Okay, that's done. Will the new transistors be quieter than the old ones? Well, here's how the guitar input sounded before, and here's how it sounds now. Again, before and after. Victory! We did the best job in the world getting rid of that noise. Well, maybe I'm a little biased. Let's see how much the amp is biased too. Now to check that, we'll calculate the current on the power transistors. We do this with no input signal, so the amp is at idle. This is called the idling current or bias. Kenwood tells us it should be 30 milliamps. Why 30 milliamps? Well, at this current, the transistors are on, but just barely. And at idle, that's exactly what we want. In a class AB output such as this, the transistors work in a complementary fashion, and that means one transistor handles the positive of the sign, and the other handles the negative. Transistors require a certain amount of current to turn on, so if we allow them to turn completely off, there would be a gap in response as the sign passes the zero point. And this leads to nasty crossover distortion. So keeping the transistors always on, even just a little, helps to create a nice clean output. To calculate idling, or bias current, we measure the voltage across the emitter resistors. In our circuit, that's resistor 63 for the left channel, and resistor 64 for the right. Each is 0.47 ohms, and Ohm's law tells us that voltage equals current times resistance. So we take the 0.47 ohms, multiply it by our desired 30 milliamps, and find that the voltage across these resistors should be 14.1 millivolts. Also note that there are two trimmers, VRE1 and VRE2, which allow us to adjust this voltage. So let's put a meter across our left channel emitter resistor now, and adjust VRE1 until we have about 14.1 millivolts. Right about there. Stay. Stay. Good boy. Great. Now let's repeat this for the right channel. Right about there. Close enough. Let's do a couple of quick bench tests on the receiver now. And for that, I'll load up the Spectra Plus software. You can't see it, but behind the receiver, I have a dummy load set up, the Spectra DAC interface, and an attenuator. I'm going to load up my presets for power testing now, so we can check out how many watts per channel our receiver is putting out. 
Okay, and you can see here, I'm going to be inputting a one kilohertz tone and the level will be one volts RMS per channel. I also want to monitor THD, so I can click this button here. I'll just put this window over here. And these two windows are basically oscilloscopes, so we can check out the waveform. Uh, this is the left channel and the right. The receiver is rated for 33 watts per channel continuous into eight ohms with both channels driven. Let's see how well it actually does. Click our run button. Now I'll turn up the volume. Okay, so we can see by the waveforms that that's about as far as we can go without seeing some clipping. The total harmonic distortion in the left channel is about 0.75% uh, and uh, about the same on the right, about 0.75, 0.76%. Our voltage output is 15.3 volts on the left and 15.2 volts on the right. So we can see that the left and right channels are very well balanced. And 15.2 volts into 8 ohms works out to be about 29 watts. So the receiver is putting out a nice clean signal up to about 29 watts per channel. Now to reach the rated output of 33 watts per channel, we're going to have to crank up the voltage to about 16.3 volts per channel. Uh, let's see how much distortion we have when we go that far. So right about... Right about there. Now we're at 33 watts per channel, and we can see though that our total harmonic distortion jumped way up to over 3%. Let's back it down to 1%. Right about there. So at 1% total harmonic distortion, which is acceptable, we're getting about 15.4 volts per channel and that works out to being just under 30 watts per channel. So the receiver isn't performing quite as well as claimed, but pretty good nonetheless. Let's move on now to doing a frequency test. And for this test, we'll be outputting a sweep signal from zero hertz to 22,000 hertz. And this will give us an idea of just how flat the frequency response of the receiver is. Okay, here we go. Okay, now on the first sweep, we saw a little bit of a dip here, but sometimes that happens on the first run with the DAC. Uh, let's let it sweep over again and see if that flattens out. Okay, just as I suspected, on the second run, we have a much better result. And you can see by the red line that our output is very flat from uh, 20 to 20,000 hertz on the left channel and also very flat on the right channel as well. Okay, very good. I'm satisfied that the receiver is working just fine. Okay, and before we put the receiver back together, uh, I just want to fix something that's been bugging me. Notice how the spring reverb really bounces around, and that's fine normally, but for transport, you're supposed to be able to lock it in place with this lever and arm that pushes the reverb against these upper brackets. The foam pads and the mechanism have all disintegrated though, so even in the lock position, the reverb still bounces around. Let's install these new pads, one on the lever arm, and under the two top brackets. Okay, let's give it a try. Yeah, much better. Okay, let's put the receiver back together now. Okay, I'm pretty excited. It's time now to hand the KR6170 over to some musicians for some demonstrations. Actually, you know what? Let's do that in the next episode. Stay tuned. Looking for a shiny new gadget for your bench? Some good books on electronics, vintage hi-fi or old radios? Indispensable tools, cleaners or other products? Check out my new Amazon shop and help the channel. Lots of great products I actually own, use and recommend. Plus my thoughts on each one link in the description. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.